to the Valley of the Emu. You know, mate, a whole lot of the stories you hear about Australia sound like the truth's been bent a bit. Well, maybe a little, but mostly it's fair dinkum, which in Aussie talk means true and reliable. Modern Australians are busy turning their 20th century dreams to realities of steel and concrete, taking those big bites of progress and doing our best to make the future do just what we wanted to do. But the hustle and bustle stick pretty much to the coastal edges of the continent. And not far behind this fringe of civilization lies the magnificent and terrifying outback. Here, all sorts of animals that can't be found anywhere else on Earth are busy living their lives too. Of course, there's the kangaroos. Forty different kinds of them, as a matter of fact. There's the platypus, the world's only egg-laying mammal. Strange reptiles, like the thorny devil lizard. The echidna, a kind of combination of anteater and porcupine. Marsupial koala bears. And the emus, the huge flightless birds that are the Aussie version of the ostrich. All these creatures and many more are considered sacred by the Aboriginal tribes who still make their Stone Age homes in the vast reaches of the interior. The Aborigines are truly people of the earth who trace their beginnings back to the long ago dream time of creation. In the dream time, they say, animal spirits and men's spirits walked together. And when they separated and became kangaroo and lizard and bird and the men's spirits became men, they all remain true brothers. And this is what their dances and their lives celebrate. When the British settlers came, steadily moving westward, their dreams were only of huge cattle and sheep stations. Men like Stumpy Michael, the Durricks, and Willie MacDonald would cut their mark on a bottle tree and take up a million acres around it. Separating these cattle stations from the outback are enormous fence lines, called dingo fences. One of them is over 3,500 miles long. But strangely, they're not there to keep the livestock in. They keep the wildlife out, and especially the dingo, the tough little wild dog that's one of the stockman's biggest problems. There's those who say the dingo came to Australia side by side with the Aborigines 20,000 years ago or more, and maybe that's true. But one thing's sure, mate, for as long as anyone can remember, there's been dingoes. This particular little lady was out hunting for some tucker, that's our word for food. And like any dingo, she was quick as a possum up a gum tree. Thank you. 
Back at the den, her two hungry pups were anxiously waiting for mother's return. It was just as well there were only the two of them. At the rate they'd been growing lately, half a rabbit apiece would be just about right, thank you. So that meant mum would have to go hungry until she could round up something else. It didn't seem quite a fair crack of the whip, but after all, the young ones came first. Before long, the food was gone. The pups were full, for the moment, and it was nap time. But the young male, the stronger and more active of the two, wasn't all that sleepy today. It looked like Mum was on her way back to the place where all the rabbits came from, and the pup couldn't resist the sudden impulse to tag along. At first, the desert seemed friendly enough. It was September, which is spring down under, and everything was at its best. A whole world waiting to be explored. Of course, that meant a lot of the other locals were out for a bit of spring as well. You've never seen anything quite like this dragon lizard and he wasn't even sure he wanted to. But before long, his dingo instincts got the best of him. If it was alive, you chased it, even when it disappeared. Mother Dingo didn't know her pup was out larking about in the bush or she'd have run him home in a hurry. It was tough enough out here for her, let alone a young one. Anyway, just about now, she'd caught a really promising scent. Kangaroos, prime targets for a hunting dingo, especially with the chance to trap one up against the dingo fence. headlong flight took it into the fence where there was a break in the wire. Good luck for the roo. Bad luck for Mother Dingo.
For three days, the Willy Willys had raced over the parched Gibber Plain, and the wind had screamed. And then, as suddenly as it had come, it was gone, and all was still. The pup was almost trapped in the debris, but he still had the dingo courage and the dingo toughness, and it looked as if he were going to need them both. There's well over a hundred varieties of snakes in Australia, many poisonous and many constrictors, like this python. Normally it fed on rabbits and bandicoots, but it was not about to turn up its blunt nose at a dingo pup. His name was Wadjuri. He was Pijanjara, one of the ancient nomadic tribes of the central desert who've wandered the outback for as long as the dingo, which they call Warrigal, and look upon as friends and allies. Kumba. Kumba. He called the pup Kumba which in Pijanjara meant little brother. For many weeks, Wajiri had been traversing the great desert on a ritual hunt or walkabout. He was expected to make it entirely on his own. But the elders of the tribe had said nothing about having a dingo pup along for a friend and companion. That is, if he wanted to come. But that, of course, would okay. be completely up to Kumba. Because their lives depended totally on animals, trees, rain, and all the creatures and aspects of nature, the Aborigines came to give these things supernatural powers, and to believe that everyone has a totem spirit which controls his destiny throughout his lifetime. These ritual rock carvings represented the track of the emu, and the emu was Wadjuri's totem. He'd been given the task of obtaining some of its feathers as a symbol of his walkabout, the feat that would prove his manhood and win him membership in the inner circle of his tribe. He did his best to explain all this to Kumba, but naturally Kumba didn't understand a thing. Like any good dog, though, he enjoyed being talked to and was ready to follow along and do his bit, whatever it was. To some people, a goanna lizard might look just a bit uninviting. But to Wadjuri and Coomba, it was good bush tucker. Better than chicken, some say. A lot easier to find out here, too. But certainly no easier to catch.
Anyway, come sundown, over a little blaze made with fire sticks, it was good stick-up meat for boy and dog. If Coomba still had any doubts about Wadgery, they were certainly gone now. The Great Central Plain is about three quarters of all the land in Australia. It's flat, arid, scorching and empty. We Aussies say that a bloke who would travel it if he didn't have to would visit the devil for a holiday. But Wadgery, in his language, with monumental understatement, simply says, grong grong, very hot, and he travels on. Among the Pichinjara tribe, there's an ancient legend of a billabong in the back of beyond where the grass grows high and emus live the year round. Wadjury's totem had spoken in his dreams that he would be the one to find it, and he was determined to go farther than his people had ever gone before. But he'd need water along the way, and now in the distance he spotted a patch of scribbly and ghost gum. They could mean water though it might only be damp sand, which his people knew how to suck dry of its moisture and then spit out again. As dry as a sunstruck bone, but he'd give it a try. He'd seen his father dig down six feet to find a tiny seep. Meantime, Coomba's desert dog nose had led him to another spot. This time for sure, he proved he'd be able to earn his keep along the way. It was a fair marvel, as sweet as a wild bee's honey bag. When Wadgery lay down to rest with his belly full, he thanked his totem emu for the little desert dingo. Nothing to be frightened of, just an old bush prospector. Here for the same reason Wadgery had come, the hope of water. Who are you, boy? What tribe are you? Aranda, Pittenboo, Pittenjara? What are you doing way out here by yourself anyway, eh? Ah, hunting emu. Well, you won't find no emu around here. I'm going off Uluru way. Maybe find a little gold. There's a valley over there. Plenty water, plenty grass. Maybe still a few emus. But if you throw your clubber on the back camel, over there, you can come along with me. Is that all right with you? To some people's way of thinking, it might seem strange for the old swaggy to bother with an Aboriginal boy and his dog. But the ruling philosophy of the outback is sharing. 
So Wadgeri had no feeling that he was imposing. The old man was going his way and he had camels. Wadgeri would contribute what he could and there was room for him. It was no problem. Their path took them through the dead heart of the continent and one day past the great monolith of Ayers Rock, a single piece of sandstone over two miles long, a sacred site to the Aboriginal people. Here in what they call the dreaming place, the place of creation, Wadgeri saw the cave paintings which his people believed to be of non-human origin, the mythical beings of the dream time who actually became the paintings. Somehow he felt a part of them and they made him even stronger in his determination to complete the ritual task he'd been given. They were a thousand miles the other side of sundown now and needed water badly. But the old man was as tough as fence wire and he kept moving on, leading the camels and studying the ground until at last they moved over a rise and found the billabong. Wadgeri was sure that they must be very close now to the legendary valley of the emu. First though, there was time to relax a little and celebrate. So this would be the parting of the ways between Wadgeri and the old prospector. It might have seemed abrupt, but that's the way things worked in the outback. They'd made the journey together and now each would go his own way again. It was as simple as that. Suddenly, Wadgeri's heart jumped like a box of birds. Emu tracks, fresh ones.
a boy? Mm. Well, boy, where's your mate? Where's your mate, eh? Is there something wrong, boy? Let's go see what it is. What's wrong with you, mate, eh? What's wrong? Can you tell me what's wrong? It looked like the boy had just about had it. Unconscious, no bruises or cuts. It could only mean one thing, snake bite. He tried what little first aid he could. First, get the feet below the heart. Then, suck out the poison. He even applied a crude rope tourniquet. But if he didn't get him to a doctor soon, he wouldn't have any more chance than a rabbit in a bushfire. Good morning, Doctor. This is Whiskey Yankee Popper Angus Downs calling with an urgent medical. This is Whiskey Yankee Popper Angus Downs calling with an urgent medical. Stand by, please. Station with emergency medical, go ahead. We've just had a boy brought in from the bush with a snake bite in the lower part of the right leg. He's suffering a fair bit of pain, and I presume you'll send a plane to pick this fellow up. Over. 200 miles away in the Alice, as the town of Alice Springs is called, the urgent message was received and logged by the 24-hour monitor of the Royal Flying Doctor Service. Within minutes, a plane was dispatched and a doctor was on his way. 
this unique service, which covers an area of over 400,000 square miles, was pioneered in Australia to bring medical help, without which, as they say in the outback, many would simply do a perish. though the huge bird was going to swallow Wadjury up, or at least carry him off somewhere. But no matter what happened to his master, Coomba would stay with him. How are his chances, Doctor? Well, I think he's going to be all right. But the quicker we can get him to the hospital, the better off he'll be. Well, he looks to be a strong lad. Thanks, Doctor. Have a good trip. Springs, Foxtrot Delta Echo, Endurance 250, and three persons on board. Foxtrot Delta Echo, this is Alice Springs. Time 0619 and a half, area QNH 1021. Foxtrot Delta Echo, could you uh, advise that we will require an ambulance to meet us on arrival? And also, could you notify CSIRO that we have something special for them? Of course, Coomba couldn't know what CSIRO meant or the part it would play in his life. He was too busy looking down at a strange new kind of desert growth, the city of Alice Springs, the largest community in Central Australia. Once on the ground, an ambulance was there for watchery. And for Coomba, the CSIRO was waiting. The government research agency that, among other things, studies the native plants and animals of the outback. So they were separated again. And as far as the little dingo knew, it might well be forever. In Alice Springs Hospital, Wadjury was quickly started on a program of the latest anti-venine and antibiotic injections. Here he was safe as a joey in his mum's pouch. Coomba too was safe, though he wasn't quite so comfortable. Like doctors and scientists the world over, the CSIRO researchers were embarrassingly personal, wanting to know Coomba's every dimension, even the length of his tail. But he stoically endured the indignities. He even condescended not to bite them when they checked his teeth. Of course, he was by no means the first dingo they'd ever studied. Because of the continuing feud between stockmen and dingoes, the CSIRO had been busy for many years on a long-range study of the dingoes, in hopes of learning how to control their numbers and keep them from preying on livestock. Meantime, Wadjury was doing well, but he still needed a lot of rest. And as he dozed, he remembered the words of an old song about the dream time long ago, from the corroboree dances of his people. Up and up soars the evening star, hanging there in the sky. 
men watch it at the place of the emu, the place of the clouds, the place of the evening star. Far off at the place of the mist, the place of the lilies, the place of the emu, the lotus, the evening star hangs there on its long stalk, held by the spirits. It wasn't long before Wadjeri was well enough to be discharged, and he and Kumba were together again, about to head back towards the far-off land from which they'd come. During their stay, though, they'd made some good friends who wanted to give the boy and his dingo a little fun and a closer look at the city of Alice Springs. The Alice, which dominates the Central Australian desert, is one of the most isolated cities in the world. It's served by one highway and a railroad running a thousand miles through the desert. big surprise, though, was still in store. Each year, the people of the Alice organize a yachting regatta in the dry bed of the Todd River. And if we Aussies decide to have boat races and water sports, well, Stone the Crow's mate, a little thing like the fact that there's no water won't slow us down the least bit. Wadjeri had never seen a boat, let alone a surfer, but he certainly understood the fun and excitement. At the same time, though, he found himself longing for the silence and the harsh earth of his own country. He was fascinated by this miraculous view from the metal bird, and especially the red rock country near the old billabong. Not far from here, he was sure, would be the hidden valley of the emu. The first things to go were the uncomfortable trappings of civilization. And now Wadjeri and Kumba would take up the long, fateful trail of the emu, right where they'd left it off. At the billabong, he found an unexpected bonus, the length of rope the old prospector had left there when he made the tourniquet. It came to him that this might be just the thing he'd need to trap the emu. Here too were his means of livelihood, the spear and throwing stick and boomerang, right where he had dropped them when the snake had struck him. He was sure he was close to the end of his quest now, and with great determination, he and Coomba set out on a methodical search of the area around the billabong.
It was the morning of the third day when they finally found it, the place of the emu. After all Wadjeri had been through, it almost seemed as if he was still dreaming. But they were real enough. Now he would have to be very clever though, for the emu were his brothers and he could not kill one. He must somehow take the feathers from the swift and dangerous birds without harming them in any way. This was exactly why he'd brought the rope. Marjorie knew the big birds would be able to evade him easily. In fact, they seemed more curious than frightened of the boy and his dog. But his idea was just to pick out a few of them and try to herd them in the right direction in hopes that one would hit the snare. It was more dangerous than it looked, for the emu can rip up a man or a dingo with one slash of its great claws. Wadjeri wound up hoist on his own cooler bar. To Coomba, it looked as if he'd planned to do this all along. Maybe it was some kind of game. The young tree couldn't hold his weight for long, and as it relaxed, Wadjeri was able to get free. But the emus were gone. It might be weeks before he found them again, if ever. Then he saw the feathers. But did he have the right to claim them? After all, he hadn't actually plucked them. But it was true that he and Coomba had caused the emu to run through the thorn bush where they'd been caught. Surely they would satisfy his totem. For Wadjeri and Coomba now, there only remained the long walk home but it would be a happy one. Not only had Wadjeri obtained the emu's feathers, but he'd had many other great adventures, and he would have wonderful stories to tell around the campfire. Stories of iron birds and great cities and boat races. But perhaps best of all was the story of Coomba, the Warrigal, the little desert dingo who'd helped him do all these things and would always be his friend, a part of his life and a part of his tribe. Thank <laughs> you. 
Let's go.